Hey guys, so the patrons of mine who donate $5 a month or more get a chance to ask me questions in these Q&A videos. So if you'd like a chance to ask questions to be answered in these videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon and uh, make this channel and these videos possible. So the patrons have asked me a load of questions, but mainly about economics and also uh, Lend-Lease. I'm not sure why, it just seems to be a themed. Uh, so hence the video. So without further ado, let's uh, let us begin. Sweden420 said, There is a popular conception in the US that the Soviet Union only defeated the Nazis because of American Lend-Lease. My question is, what was the real impact of Lend-Lease, and how critical was it to the Soviet war effort? Did American supplies beat the Nazis in Russia, or is that just Cold War propaganda? And Darren Martin also said, I would like to know more about the US Lend-Lease as well. This is a question that comes up all the time. I think I've said in a few videos now, look, I'm going to do this at some point, and I will. I'll do it in more detail. But I have read a little bit, and I'm, I'll give you what I know so far. According to Alexander Hill, he states that the official Soviet history of the war in 1965 said that Britain and the USA delivered 401,400 automobiles and 2,599,000 tons of oil products. So basically, logistical-type supplies. But to put the oil figure in perspective, Toprani says that the Soviets were producing 29 million tons of oil per year in 1939. So Lend-Lease oil wasn't a substantial amount, although it may have been a type of oil that the Soviets were short of. But the official Soviet history also says that the amount of actual equipment for the troops at the front delivered by Lend-Lease was not that much either. The Soviets produced 489,900 artillery pieces, whereas Lend-Lease delivered 9,600, which is 2%. The Soviets produced 136,800 aircraft, whereas Lend-Lease delivered 18,700, which is 13%. The Soviets produced 102,500 tanks, whereas Lend-Lease delivered 10,800 tanks, which is 10%. Now, this is the official Soviet history, which is no doubt biased and so on. And I haven't had the time to do much double-checking for the moment. But for the time being, I would suggest that Lend-Lease was more logistical and economic in nature rather than equipment and tanks. It's also worth noting that Lend-Lease only really begins in September of 1941 and doesn't really start impacting the Soviets until October 1941, when Britain is shipping equipment to the Soviet Union. The United States and its Lend-Lease doesn't really get going until, I'd say, late 1942 and really 1943, really. Um, so is it really a factor, really? It's hard to say. The Soviets, by 1941, by the 31st of December 1941, had lost 20,500 tanks, and of this huge amount was 3,200 medium or heavy tanks, according to Krivoshev. So it's quite a lot. And by this point, Britain had delivered 259 Valentines and 187 Matildas. And not all of these are actually reached the front by this point. So this is barely 6.5% of the total Red Army tank strength at the time, and 25% of the medium and heavy tanks in service. So again, this was a helpful, but not vitally critical amount of tanks and equipment. What I think is probably more important in 1941 and 42 was the 34,856 tons of rubber shipped from Britain to the, the Soviet Union, since there was a shortage of rubber in the Soviet Union. Also, 14,147 tons of aluminium, and uh, this was delivered by the end of June 1942, compared with Soviet production of 67,000 tons in 1941 and 51,000 tons in 1942. So that's a reasonable amount there. There was also a lot of medical supplies, radios, field telephones and wires, and all of this stuff was in short supply in the Soviet Union. So I'm going to quote from Hill. During 1941-42, the United States was unable to supply material aid to the Allies, and in particular the Soviet Union, in anything like the quantities it would subsequently provide. 
In this period, the United States was not only shifting industrial capacity to a relatively neglected military sector, but also building up its own armed forces to levels appropriate to the opposition faced. The quantitative British and Commonwealth contribution to the Lend-Lease supply pool was therefore far more significant during the period of the first Moscow Protocol than it would subsequently be. So basically, early in the war, the British are actually supplying a lot more in proportion to the United States than what you know the United States are doing. But basically, if British levels are low, so are the United States levels, and and so therefore you could say this first period, 1941 to 42, it was quite. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you could really uh, suggest that Lend-Lease was the thing that kept the Soviets going. It, it helped, but it wasn't substantial enough in this period. So the way I would kind of sum this up is to say there's three periods in the war when it comes to Lend-Lease. There's the beginning bit where there is no Lend-Lease. Uh, so this is 1941, basically, until about December. And then... You've got a middle period where it's basically British Lend-Lease is actually doing more than the American Lend-Lease um, at this stage, which says a lot. <laughs> so that, that period is probably late 1941 to 42, And then you've got the latter period of the war, so late 42, mainly 1943 onwards till 1945, when American Lend-Lease really ramps up. And I, I guess it really depends on when you think the war was won or lost, um, if when there's a turning point or not. So I'm going to suggest that, because this seems to be the consensus now with many academic historians, that 1941 was when the Germans were prevented from winning. So if that is the case, Lend-Lease isn't a factor at all. If you think the turning point is 1942, then you have a case for British Lend-Lease and a little bit of American then lease, but not a lot. So you could say that. And then if it's 43 onwards, really that's when you could say America wins the war. But I don't, it's not, it's not as clear cut as that. So I'm going to suggest this. The Germans weren't prevented from going from Berlin to Moscow by then lease. Like that didn't stop them. What stopped them was the Soviets. And then British Lend-Lease kind of buys a little bit of time and helps the Soviets kind of hold on in like the Blau era, let's say. And then American Lend-Lease kicks in and allows the Soviets to then go from Moscow to Berlin. So it Lend-Lease doesn't like this without Lend-Lease, the Soviets would wouldn't have lost. Lend-Lease kind of helps them win the war, but it's not as vital and it's not the only factor, I guess is the way I would put it. And it really depends on when you think the turning point, quote unquote, turning point actually happened, if there was one, and also to what extent Lend-Lease is as vital. I personally don't think it's as vital. I, th I think the war would have gone on longer without Lend-Lease, but it wouldn't have been lost I think it probably would have gone to 46 or 47, but I don't think... And maybe the Western Allies would have had to fight harder um, because the Soviets would have been further back, let's say. So they probably would have had to lose a lot more guys, get into Berlin, and would have had to take Berlin themselves. And and so Lend-Lease really helped shorten the war, but it wasn't necessarily what prevented the, the Germans from winning it, I guess, is probably the best way I can put it. I hope that makes sense. I hope that, I think that answers everything. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Kevin asked, In your video about Germany and oil, you said that Germany had to invade the Soviet Union by mid-1941. Because if they didn't, they would never have had the fuel capacity to be able to do it at a later time. Prior to that, the Soviets had been supplying oil to Germany under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which allowed them to conduct large offensives during 1940. How could they not have had enough fuel for a later invasion if they were getting a steady supply of it? Why would that not have given them the option of waiting and still having a stockpile? So there's there's kind of two points to this question. So the first, what you have to realize is that even with, even with Soviet trade, the Germans are in a massive deficit of oil. So it would have actually taken two Romanias in order to, to cover the entire deficit of oil. 
So they are running out of oil before they declare war and even including the trade. So the, that's why they have to kind of go for it because if they don't go for it now, they won't have the oil in 42 in order to do it. So 41 is like the last kind of point that they could do it unless Britain had surrendered or peaced out. Um, so that that's why. And people seem to quite not quite grasp it's like, oh, why don't you just trade war with the, the, the Soviets? It's like, well, that's not enough anyway. And even if it was, the whole point of going to war in the first place was to take the resources. This is why this is all to do with Hitler's philosophy, looking at the world and so on. And he needs to take food and he also needs to take the oil in the East. And he wants to conquer the East. It's all in Mein Kampf and whatever. So his entire philosophy is let's go to war and let's gear up the economy with autarky, i.e. self-sufficiency, in order to allow this to happen. That's why he goes to war in the first place. He goes to Poland in order to then go to the Soviet Union. And it's only it only seems like France and Britain and whatever is an afterthought the, the focus is always on the east. So he's going east anyway, and it makes sense to do it in 41. It really does. The Soviets were not prepared at all. They were caught in the middle of a mobilization effort. They were caught in a, a reorganization effort. And I think if they had gone in 42, the, a, they wouldn't have had enough oil anyway. But even if they had, it would have been worse for them because the Soviets would have been better prepared. So really, the Soviet oil production wasn't enough for both Germany and the Soviet Union. And so therefore, like they have to take it in order to get it. I think that answers your question. I hope it does. <laughs> Jim Land asked, How much difference would it have made had the Germans been able to cut and hold the volume for longer? While the Germans probably would never have been able to get enough oil out of the Caucasus, it is more plausible that they could have denied it to the Soviets. Also, it would have been much harder for them to receive Lend-Lease. Would they have been able to keep their army fed without Ukraine or the USA? This is actually related to what uh, Trinimac said. What sea land routes did the Allies use to supply the Soviet war effort, and how much did they contribute? So th this question is very much related to the uh, Lend-Lease question, but the the problem is, if you look at a map, you've got the the um, the Caspian Sea. There's no reason why they can't go around that. And maybe it was more difficult, but you've also got to you've also got to see that um, Astrakhan is there, and if they'd have dropped off the supplies there, they could have shipped them north. So, i oh, not shipped them north. Actually, driven across land. So there's no real reason as to why taking Stalingrad or taking the Volga near Stalingrad would have actually prevented the Soviets from receiving oil shipments. Like, this is this is where the flaw in the logic comes in. I, I, it would have been better for them to, to take out the... Uh, I mean, it would have ha would have made things more difficult, but would it have actually prevented them? I don't think so. It would have been better for them to concentrate taking Baku and whatever else, um, or bombing them, um, than actually blocking the Volga. But blocking the Volga would have helped a little bit, but I don't think it would have stopped anything um i guess and this is this is again why taking uh persia or iran and uh allowing that shipment around the caspian sea is important or even through the caspian sea is important which is why they did it i think um would they have been able to keep the army fed without the ukraine or the usa <laughs> Without both, I think it would have been a struggle because the Soviets were already starving in 1942. Um, the populace is actually going hungry. It's not they're not starving. Start they're not starving, starving, but they are sort of going hungry. And you get reports. I've said this before of the, um, you know people joining the army thinking the food will be better at the front, and then finding out that it's not. So there is that element to it, but. The, the the Ukraine and the Caucasus, the Northern Caucasus, are taken, and that's like the breadbasket area of uh, Russia, of the Soviet Union. So without that area, the food is coming from some other areas, but also the USA. So without the USA, yes, it probably would have been worse. Do I have the numbers? No. <laughs> 
So I can't say to what extent it was going to be bad. Um, but what you also do have to remember is that, yes, they lost all the food and the bread basket and blah, 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 but they also lost this, a significant portion of the population, like the most dense portion of the population. So while they are going hungry, they're not necessarily starving because you've also lost all the cities as well. Um, so there, there is a little bit of a thing there. But I would say that it would have been a struggle in 1943. And this is the thing, I can't predict the future and I can't say for certain what would have happened. I can only kind of guess. Um, I suspect, so it probably would have survived through 43, mostly, but then it would have probably been, if they hadn't have taken something back and gotten more food, I think they probably would have collapsed by 44, but I'm only guessing. There's no way of actually knowing that um, because you can't, you can't predict the future. This is the further you go away from where you are, you can predict a few days in advance, maybe, but you can't go beyond that. Um, and that's where a lot of alternate histories don't seem to make any sense. So I'm just guessing, but I, by going off what I know, I suspect that the Soviets would have been in trouble in 43 and then maybe collapsed in 44-ish. Um, because if you think about it, food is what caused the Soviet, the Bolshevik Revolution anyway, and the February Revolution. So it makes sense. Elijah asked... Hi Tick, we hear a lot about how Hitler wanted to secure the Caucasus oil fields, but there is an equally rich supply of coal in the Donbass. Yes, the area is subject to modern Russia. Well, we won't go into that conflict. Uh, during Operation Blau, there was a mighty delaying action fought in the region as the Axis pushed towards Stalingrad. In the time that the Donbass was temporarily under Axis control, did they successfully exploit their newfound abundance of coal in any significant way? Or did French and Scandinavian coal mines serve all their needs? So prior to recording this, I tried to find out about German coal and was I've not been very successful, if I'm honest. None of my sources seem to have anything on it specifically. Um, now, what was interesting was that there was a little bit on Soviet coal. So in order to answer this question, I've looked into a couple of sources, Deprani, but also, and more importantly perhaps for this one, is Edgerton's Oil, Coal and War. And uh, please check out the pinned comment for all the sources and so on. So what we, what we have to realise is that Germany produced uh, 240 million tonnes of coal in 1940-41, to 41, and this is from its pre-war territories. The other conquered territories, not including the Eastern Front, but the other conquered territories came to 76 million tonnes uh, for the same period. Uh, and this basically equated to 315 million tonnes. I don't know what the consumption of this was, um, but including the occupied territories, this rose to 348 million tonnes by 1943 to 44. So there's a lot being produced. Now, Toprani states that the Germans actually had 22 billion tons of soft coal in reserve, and this was enough to last 170 years, and 90 million tons of hard, uh, sorry, 90 billion tons of hard coal in reserve as well, which would last 600 years. So, basically, what I can probably suggest is that. Germany had the coal, but Italy and Japan didn't, because Italy was actually, um, before the war, Italy and Japan were reliant on other powers, whereas Germany was actually producing enough at least to supply itself. And so that's the main point to take away from this. Now, uh, the Donbass is actually important, but not for necessarily for Germany. It's important for the USSR. It actually supplied about half, or if not more than half, of the USSR's coal, which is around 80 million tons. And then when it fell to the Germans in 1941, the Soviets had no choice but to destroy it, which prevented its use. And Edgerton says that the Germans sent in 2,000 miners, plus thousands of prisoners of war, but this didn't actually affect it much because they couldn't get anything from it. And uh, he concludes by saying at some points Germany had to export coal to the Ukraine. So they weren't really getting much coal out of it. Kennedy in The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers says that uh, by the end of 
Operation Barbarossa, coal production was down by 57% in the Soviet Union, which would tie into what Edgerton's saying. Um, pig iron was down 68% and so on. So, yeah, it makes sense that in, in actuality, what we're seeing here is this, the Germans are taking these areas and this is denying the Soviets the use of coal and other resources rather than being exploited for the Germans. And that's perhaps more important. If they're down 57% in coal production, then that's quite significant because what you are what you have to realize is that the, the, the troops don't usually march around. They actually get to the front lines or near the front lines using trains, and those trains run on coal. So if they're using coal and they haven't got enough of it, that's going to affect the war effort plus other areas behind the scenes because uh, a lot of this coal is being used in factories to power, you know, and burn things and whatever else and melt um, metals and so on. So it's going to affect other areas of the economy. So this is perhaps more important, the fact that the Germans are denying the Soviets their coal rather than taking it for themselves. And what's also interesting is that the British from 1943 onwards sent one in 10 of their conscripts into the mines. So rather than, you know, you're getting drafted into the military, but you're not. You, one in 10 of you are getting sent down the mines. Uh, apparently it was 21,800 um, young men. And 8,000 of these were applying to be, you know, taken out of the mines, basically, because it, it wasn't a popular job even with uh, normal mining wages apparently um, and it, uh, Edgerton also says that Britain and Germany had twice the number of miners the US did and produced one third the amount of coal which was about 300 tons per uh, per miner per annum and I think the reason for this is that Britain and Germany their coal mines are actually quite old and uh, I, I've read this somewhere but I don't know where it is the 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 older a mine gets, the harder it is to extract the uh, the minerals and stuff like that. Um, I don't. Somebody who is actually a miner might be able to give us a bit more information on this, but that's what I've read somewhere in the in the distant past when I studied this in college. But that was something as well. So the older the mines are, the worse the production is going to be, and that makes sense because the USA's mines will, at this point at least will be newer. So that makes sense. And Edgerton actually concludes, and this is quite interesting, he concludes by saying the Axis lost because of the lack of oil. However, he states that because of the lack of oil, the Axis powers, quote, lost the capacity to move coal to, and it was coal that was the central raw material of the war, the most mined, the most moved, and the most used by every belligerent. Which is quite interesting because... How can it be the most central thing, but also the, the oil was what lost the access to war? It's it's very kind of contradictory there in a little sense, but it makes it does make sense. Like because of the lack of oil, they now couldn't move the coal, which then impacted other areas of the industry. So this wasn't just a front line. Oh, we don't have enough oil for our tanks. It, the oil is a problem behind the scenes because it impacts the rest of the economy. So it's definitely food for thought. Prokop asked. Hey Tick, were the Axis aware that the Soviets relocated their industry further into the Soviet heartland? If yes, do you know if any significant efforts were made to stop the relocation? I don't know, and I can't find anything on it specifically. However, what I will say is that the Soviets were very, very concentrated on getting this, like shipping the factories to the Urals and the workers and the machine tools and so on. And doing that actually limited their production in 41 and this goes back to lend lease actually lend lease helped put up the numbers a little bit during that time while they moved the factories and the factories only really come back online mid 1942 and by the time you get to late 1942 with the stalingrad campaign that's when the factories are pumping out enough tanks to actually supply the troops now and then enough guns and whatever else so obviously it's very significant and it's probably a minor miracle. It's one of the most mind-boggling. How can you just take an entire factory and ship it east? It's like it's 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 it must have required significant effort, you know, efforts to do that. Um, but 
and and the trains were prioritized as well but i don't know how much the germans knew about it and i don't think they could spare much to stop it anyway because i mean the germans don't have long range bombers they don't have well not many and they don't have you know it's it's not like they have the same sort of air fleet that the us and the british then get later in the war with like the lancaster bomber and stuff where they have these massive planes dropping tons of bombs so really there's i mean other than hitting the trains as they were trying to get you know get away but even then i've not i've not come across anything that really specifically mentions it and it's really one of those things that should be actually should be researched but in english I, but there's nothing there is literally nothing and they, again this is where it's like these things like this that the soviets are doing we're not hearing about because it's not been translated that you know that's that's ultimately it so unfortunately i don't really have this is probably the one question i don't actually have a proper answer for um but really if anyone can point me in the right direction brilliant because i'll use this as part of my lend lease video or do a separate video on it but i, I can't i've looked online i can't see much on it nothing specifically on it either so it's a real unknown i guess you could say so craig b asked in your opinion was there a better way that the germans could have effectively used populations they controlled perhaps using them more as a fighting force or finding a better way to use the slave labor they had acquired whenever i read about the holocaust or the way they treated pow's obviously it is very sad but it also seems very stupid and they could have used these resources better. This is actually responded to by Joseph Keenan, so I'll read it out because it's interesting. Military history visualized answers something similar. Populations in occupied territories were used uh, probably as resourcefully as the Germans could manage. They didn't have quite so much of a manpower shortage as an equipment shortage. This is why most POW or civilian prisoners were used in factories. If they didn't have enough food, the prisoners would probably just be worked, starved to death, or executed. And this is related to what Craig Marshall asked. Hey Tick, we know that Nazism has its foundations in discrimination and genocidal opinions, but what about those races, peoples who fought for the Wehrmacht or SS? There were Jews, Slavs, and others who fought for the Germans without pressure. Were they to be given special allowances post-war, assuming German victory? So let me let me give you a bit of background information on this one because it's kind of a bit. <sighs> Right, so Germany in 41, 42-ish, they are suffering under two things mainly. One is oil, we know that, but also food. Food is massively a big issue, basically. Uh, the Belgian miners went on strike in 1941 because of bad rations. The uh, Greeks are starving. The Ukrainians are starving because... And some guy in one of the videos went, oh, Tick thinks that the Holodomor happened in the 40s. Like, no, the Holodomor happened in the 1930s, and then the, the Germans invaded the Ukraine and starved the Ukrainians and shipped them off to the, the slave labor camps of the Reich. The 3 million POWs from the Soviets are, are uh, starved in Germany, and Greeks are starving, the Ukrainians are starving, Belarusians are starving. I'm not sure about the Baltic states, um, but basically... There's a reason for this. Like cold, hard reasoning says the German people will not starve before everyone else does. Everyone else has to starve first before the Germans do. And the German rations are decreased. I think in 41 or 42, the German rations are decreased. So if the Germans themselves are getting hungry, then you can clearly tell why they're not interested in feeding all these other people. So actually starving them is actually in some ways in... in a horrible way but in some ways a logical thing to do because this reduces the amount of food being consumed by people you know um, let's say get rid of ukrainian cities but keep the farms and those farms can keep shipping food off to the reich and that's kind of what the hunger plan was all about and what the exploitation of the east was all about so could they have used labor better not sure about foreign labor because they were already using that um could they have done better with their own people? Well, and during the whirlwind uh, by Lietke, I think that's how you say it, uh, this is a great book, I'd honestly recommend it. He says and he suggests that the German uh, populace 
they did actually have enough manpower to do what they needed to do. The problem was they didn't utilize it very well. And this kind of might be related to the Holocaust in some way because you're like, well, why would you waste people doing that when you could be, you know, building more tanks or something? So there is an argument around that and Liedke's central to that idea. So they probably could have done it more efficiently, but would it have, you know, would it have really changed anything? I don't know. Um, how could they have done it more more effectively? Well, they, you know, they could have mobilized properly and and really got the workforce going and industrial, you know, really concentrate on the industry like Spear did later on. But the problem is with that is that Hitler is very much mindful of what's happening in the rear and doesn't want a stab in the back again. I say again, it was a myth, but he thinks it wasn't a myth. That's that's the more important point. So he thinks that World War One, the, the Germans were stabbed in the back and that's what caused the end of the war. That's not what happened, but that's what he thinks. So he's very much a case of, well, we don't want to fully mobilise. We don't want to get everybody doing all this work and working for the factories and blah, 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 because that will lead to a decrease in morale, which will then cause the uh, st another stab in the back. And so he doesn't want to do that. So there's a whole element to that. And that's why it's only after Stalingrad that things started to ramp up. Hitler's also very reluctant to use, like, let's say, Ukrainians um, as, you know, fighting forces because he's scared that they might rebel. Like, he, why would you trust them? He sees the world in very much different racial groups, um, different societies. So he's not really interested in having non-German units. He does. He has the uh, Estonian 20th um Waffen SS unit uh, division. He has Ukrainian police, as we know. He's got other units in there as well, Spaniards, um, Croatians, and so on. But he's not really he's not he's a bit reluctant to use the Slavs because he sees them as slaves and doesn't view them as actual proper fighters. Um and there's Hiwis in there as well. So there's that racial element to it prevents you from so it's all right for me to go well they, they could have used but you know within the context of it it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense if you're starving the people why would you arm the same people that you're starving it doesn't there's a there's a problem with her and that's the problem that hitler's facing because of the racism and the socialism aspect of it as well now somebody else said about jews fighting with the ss i have no idea i would really sort of I don't know about that. The Slavs did, as I say about the Hiwis and stuff, and the Ukrainians had the police and whatever else, but they were always, they always seem to be behind the lines or helping out. They're not really on the front line too much, but some are, but not all of them. But were they given special allowances post-war, as, assuming there was a German victory? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. And I don't, I can't see, I can't see why they would, um, they, they may have just joined up because they didn't want to starve. It's probably the reason why. Um, practically, it's probably the reason why. And Craig Marshall also asked, I've heard conflicting reports regarding German plans of conquest if they had won. For example, I've seen people say that Ostland and Ukraine would become independent. Yet, I've also seen claims that the Germans would claim everything west of the Urals for the Reich. Yeah, also that the, the army of Russian liberation would also be granted autonomy for their service to Germany, plus other oddities like the Lockhart autonomy. Could you clear this up? Thank you. So this this is another one related to the future, which I can't really see. Um, so the German plan for Barbarossa didn't really put an end line. <laughs> It's like, we'll just keep going. I, it's like the, the line is Astrakhan, Astrakhan to Archangelist, how you say it. So it's like, they didn't even get to the Urals. It doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense. Like they just thought, we'll, we'll, we'll sort that out later. This is why it's very hard to actually say what's going to happen because there isn't a plan. Uh, Barbarossa plan was terrible as enough, you know, let alone the rest of it. Um, from what I can gather, there may have been protectionate, protectionates. There may have been states in the East, but they would have come under German domination. So it probably would have been more like the central, yeah, the, the general government. Is it the general government? The one in Poland. They probably would have been more like that 
than a separate state. Um, I don't know about the Baltics, but I suspect that the southern, like the Ukrainian area and the Caucasus and so on, that definitely, I think, would have come under German dominance because they needed the resources and Germany wasn't really about, um, you know, making satellite states, really. They wanted to conquer and exploit the resources. So, and there was a, from what I've seen, there is a plan where there's three zones. So like the Baltic zone and like a central Soviet, so central like Belarusian zone and then a southern Ukrainian zone. That's about as far as it goes. Beyond that, there wasn't really a plan. And this is why it's like, I don't actually know um, what would happen because I don't think the Germans did. They just kind of like, let's win the war first, then figure it out. So I can't, again, it's very hard for me to say anything because there isn't anything, like the plan was just not there. And this is the point. This is the point of Barbarossa. It's like, we will win and then figure everything out. It's like, no, you can't. You've got to you've got to win and have everything planned out first. It, uh, anyway. Uh, Stephanie asked, uh, at what point did the German civilians realise the war was essentially lost? I'm not talking about the leadership. I'm talking about the average German citizen bombarded by propaganda. D-Day, Kursk, or the Siege of Berlin. I don't know. I don't think you can put a date on this. This is like similar to the when was the turning point of the war question. It's like one civilian would say, oh, I knew then. And another one will say, no, I didn't know till later on. And also you've got to realize that just because they say, oh, I'm losing. Well, we're losing now. doesn't mean they're going to give up. Um, so I don't know if you can put a hard date on it. I'm going to suggest that they didn't know until after Stalingrad. Stalingrad is really the first real time. So up until Stalingrad, you could kind of say, well, the Germans knew that they were losing troops, but we're still winning, right? They've lost a million men by 1941, but at least they're winning. They're taking ground and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, well, we're not losing at this point. Stalingrad campaign, we're, at, we're moving into the Caucasus. Yay, we're winning. And it, then it's then it's a case of actually we're surrounded, actually we're dead. <laughs> and now we're falling back. So Stalingrad is basically the first time the civilians are aware that they, things aren't going right. Is that enough to say that they were losing the war? I don't know. And I don't think you can necessarily put a, a hard date on it. Certainly by... I don't know. Bagration? And, I mean, certainly by Berlin. Definitely by the time you get to Berlin, I think it's over then. No, you, a bagrash, bagration and D-Day... Because that's about the same time. It'd be very hard to argue, I think, that the German civilians weren't aware that they were losing the war. But life went on because they had to. And just because they're, they're losing it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to keep on fighting. So, um, yeah. It can't, it couldn't have been before Stalingrad. Definitely. That's, 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 I can say for certain. I don't know when, though, they would have realized. Um, when the, by the time he gets 44 in terms of sta uh, Arnhem it seems that everybody kind of knows they're losing the war so it's somewhere between 43 or let's say after Stalingrad so February 43 and September 44 that's when they know for definite that they're going to lose at some point between that date that's, that's as far as I can narrow it down anyway Jim Land said, I don't want to in any way excuse what the Germans did in World War II, but it seems to me that many of the trials were skewed toward the victor reaping the spoils. If we were to hold the Russians to the same standard as the Germans in war crimes trials, should they not have received similar post-war sentences? I'm sure some Western allies could have been put on trial as well, but the war in the West seems positively chivalrous by comparison. I'm not one of these people who... <laughs> will deny that the Allies committed atrocities. I don't know why people have this impression um, that that is what I'm doing, at least, if not everyone else is doing. So the Allies did commit atrocities. There are German shootings at Nijmegen. Uh, sorry, there's American shootings going on at Nijmegen, uh, killing Germans, uh, prisoners of war. There's uh, bombings all over the world, Japan, but also Germany, Dresden, etc., there are war crimes in all countries. The Soviets committed lots of war crimes as well, as you point out. 
So to say that every side is innocent, it's, yeah, you're right. It, it doesn't make any sense. But the war crimes of the Allies are, well, they pale in comparison to what the, the Nazis were doing. Uh, and even what the Soviets are doing, surprisingly. So if you take the Soviet, you know, because people are oh, millions died under Soviet socialism. Well, maybe, but the Soviet socialism lasted from 1917 through 1991. So yeah, a lot of people died in like a century worth of killing. Um, but in the war years, or let's, 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 let's say the 12 years that Hitler was in power, not nowhere near as the amount, well, not all, as much died in those years as compared to what the Germans were doing. Like the the National Socialists in the in Germany and conquering Europe, they killed a lot more people in that short space of time than even the Soviets. So this is exceptionally brutal by that standard. And you know, bombing campaigns and all that, and a few shootings of the POWs and stuff. What happens uh, in the war by the Allies or the Western Allies? is nothing compared to what the Germans were doing. And as I mentioned before, three million Soviet POWs are starved to death. <laughs> I don't think that, like, you know, and, oh, well, what the, what the, uh, the, the Sixth Army got starved to death when they surrendered. It's like, yeah, but only, we're talking 100,000 people surrendered to the Soviets and maybe 15,000, you know, half starved people, by the way, and 15,000 came back. That's more than what happened with the Soviet POWs, the, like the Germans murdered, basically starved to death three million Soviet POWs in 1941. So the comparison is just insane, really, really is insane. And people have, oh yeah, but the Germans, like it's, they're trying to do anything to defend what the Germans did. It's like, you, stop, stop. You need to understand that the atrocities committed by the Nazis, the, the National Socialists and Germany as a whole, in this short period of time was massive compared to what other people were doing. And I'm not saying that, you know, the Soviets are innocent or the British, British and the Americans are innocent. Absolutely not. But by comparison, it's well through the roof. Okay. So it, it's, I'm not saying it's justified, but it's at least understandable that compared to the Nazis, the Western allies, especially, but also the Soviets were not talking to the same league. The Nazis did a lot more. Um, and to kind of say that they didn't is a bit silly, really. Klaus asked, How did the Germans and Italians lose the Battle of Sicily, and why did the offensive at Kursk need to be halted because of it? Okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> let's stop. Stop, stop, stop. So the the Battle of Kursk was not stopped. Citadella was not stopped because of Sicily. I don't... There's not did not happen. There's no way. Um, they may have pulled troops out of it, but that's not the reason why it stopped. The reason why it stopped was because, the, as Glantz has pointed out in his lecture, which I will link to, um, the Germans attacked at Citadella, and within 10 days, I think it is, or 12 days, they pretty much lost it. And the... They, Manstein is going, is, is it Manstein? Yeah, Manstein's going, let me go on, let me go on, I can, I can win, I can beat them. And, and as Glanz points out, there's an entire, like, two armies or something behind the lines. They had no idea what was going on behind the lines. But that's not the reason why they lost. Citadella lost because it failed to break through, uh, because they attacked a very concentrated, uh, section of the front. But also, the Soviets counterattacked. So, the battle occurs for the Germans last, 12 days or 14 days or whatever it is. And that's the end of the history for Citadella. But Citadella is only one part of the wider Soviet counterattack. It would be like going, well, Stalingrad only lasted until November 18th. Like, no, the, the Operation Uranus then happened and en encircled Sixth Army. It's the same sort of thing that's going on here. Citadella is up until, you know, for 10 days or whatever, we're going to attack. And then this counterattack happens, which is huge and forces the Germans back. The bulge, if you know, um, you create, uh, Kursk is a bulge that goes into this, the German lines in a sense. Well, by the end of the whole of the battle, including what the Soviets do, there is no bulge. Like the, there is a line. The, the, the Germans have fallen back. So 
that's the reason why the Soviets are, are, are beating the Germans. Yes, the Germans might have had to pull units out to go to Sicily, but that's not the reason why. Um, you know, Sicily's not the reason why Kursk failed. So how did the Germans lose the Battle of Sicily? Interestingly, so I think going off what Centino says in his book, uh, the Wehrmacht retreats, which is a big hint. <laughs> uh, the Germans didn't actually want to fight the battle. Really, they sort of did. And once they realized that the Allies had actually landed and were actually on the beaches and weren't going to be counterattacked, they kind of went, well, what's the point of holding this island anyway? So then they fell back. And because they fell back, the Italians, I think the Italians, according to Satino, had about 300,000 men-ish. So they were, and they weren't particularly good um, troops. So they, they fell back as well because they had no choice. So really it was a case of, well, if, I think it was a case of if we don't stop them in the first couple of days, we're not going to be able to stop them, so we may as well fall back. Uh, so I suspect that is the reason why, in this book, you should get. Craig Marshall asked again, What was the general tier of command within Commonwealth troops? Did a colonel of the Raj have equal sway to a colonel from the home islands? Did the protectorates willingly give control of the war ministry, or was it implied force? Yes. End of question. No. Uh, so, many people don't know, the British Army is not the same as the Indian Army in World War II. They are similar. I think, you know, they're essentially run the same and they are the same nation-ish, like, because it's a colony, but they're not actually the same. Like, they've got different organisations or whatever. But what 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 happens is there is a transference of troops some british troops help out the indians some indian troops help out the british like the fourth indian, indian division fights in north africa um Orkinlecht. so wavell in north africa gets transferred over and Orkinlecht, who is in india gets moved over to like, they swap roles and Orkinlecht brings his own staff with him and so on and so forth so you know, there is a direct correlation there. They can actually do it. And I think if, if a, you know, let's say a British soldier ended up falling back into an Indian division, he would take orders from those people. Because also what you have to remember is that a lot of the British officers in the Indian army were British. Um, you know, several of them, I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but several of them who were fighting in the 4th Indian, Indian Division actually came from Britain and then moved over to the Indian Army. So there's definitely a cross... cross I don't know what you call it. Uh, there's definitely a crossover thing going on. So as far as I'm aware, yes, it was perfectly... I think it was like they didn't really see much of a difference. There was a difference. Like There's two different armies, but they all, there was so much crossover, it wasn't really an issue. They could take orders from each other if necessary. And as I say... The 4th Indian, Indian Division was fighting within 13th Corps at Crusader. No problem. So I don't see why it would have impacted the force, really. Okay, so I just want to give a bit more context to this. So India declared war on Germany on the 3rd of September 1939. And this was just days after Britain entered the war. Now, this was done by Viceroy Lord Lynn Lithgow, a Scotsman who actually announced it on the radio. Now, according to Lawrence James in The Rise and Fall of the British Empire, page 424, the Indian Congress was stunned by the declaration. Now, from what I can tell, India was directly controlled by Britain. So this wasn't like Canada, where the decision to go to war was made by the Canadians themselves. India had to follow Britain's lead. That said, according to Khan in her book, The Raj at War, there was sympathy within the Indian leadership for the war. And this is backed up by what James says as well, who says that the Congress members were aware that Britain was fighting against political systems that really could do with fighting against. And it's also worth noting that the Indian army was also voluntary, so there was no conscription, as far as I'm aware. So the motivation for going to war um, is there. Now, it, there is also another aspect to this. It, the, the motivation is linked, or interlinked, with 
India's determination to become independent. Now, this has to do with the Gandhi movement and so on. While India would fight for Britain, but only to gain her independence after the war, or, or even during the war, it seems. And this seems to be the motivation, the primary motivation, until at least 1941, when the Japanese get involved. At which point, Britain fails at Singapore, and this shows that while well, European dominance was basically waning, and that India perhaps should and could be independent. And this is when Gandhi and others really ramped up their efforts. So... For India, at the very least, uh, she just went along with the declaration of war at first, but then there was a gradual backlash against it as things uh, progressed. Now, if we contrast this to, let's say, another British dominion, Canada, who we mentioned before, Canada seems to be willing to go to war. And yeah, there, there was some reluctance just because of the, you know, the disaster that was the First World War and the, the horrors of that war are still fresh in people's minds. But Canada, Canada didn't actually need to go to war, because after the Statute of Westminster in 1931, Canada was actually a self-governing nation in the Commonwealth, and therefore she could actually decide her own foreign policy. Now, as the historian Cook says, uh, and I'll quote, Canada would never have gone to war unless Britain was threatened, end quote. And it seems that most Canadians couldn't actually stomach the idea of abandoning Britain. But it, it's also worth noting that uh, Canada's Prime Minister, William King, was absolutely aiming to gain full independence by helping Britain. That was his sort of reasoning. So that's why she declared war a few days after Britain did. So basically... What I think we can sum up by saying that the British dominions and colonies were more or less willing to go to war, but only because this would speed up the downfall of the British Empire and then help them gain independence. Uh, you know, that's how they saw it. Craig Marshall again. Can you do a battlestorm on Breslau eventually? My favourite urban fight of the war, aside from Stalingrad, Leningrad and Berlin. And this is related to what Ratty said. How good is your knowledge on modern conflicts like the Falklands War and Iraq, Afghanistan? And would you ever consider doing videos on them in the future if you do know about them? Right, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about Battlestorm and the plan for the channel because everyone keeps asking me various points about this and what I'm going to do next and blah, blah, blah. So here's, here is the plan. I want to work through the North African campaign and then the Tunisian campaign, and then Sicilian, then Italian, and then once it got to the point where it's Normandy time, then it's go to Normandy, and then fight through um, Northern France and Belgium and whatever else. That's the plan I, I want to do. Why do I want to do it like that? Because um, if I'm covering people like Montgomery, Patton, um, so on, and people have the, oh, well, is Montgomery worse or better than Patton? And there's this whole internet thing, right? I want to settle that debate uh, entirely. You know, it's kind of hard because Patton's an army commander and Montgomery's a field marshal, but never mind. Uh, I'd like to kind of get into that and wade into it and go, well, this is what actually happened. You guys decide for yourself type thing. So that's what I want to do. And that's why I've never said, is Montgomery a good or bad general? I'm not, I'm not committing to that. I'm waiting for me to go through this entire campaign and you know entire route in order to make that decision so i refuse to actually even consider answering the montgomery question um and that's why i've not really looked into what the americans are doing even though it probably should be so that's why i'm doing the north african campaign that's why i started it so i could measure montgomery compared to what came before him and say well he's better than them or he's worse than them or whatever and then how he compares to Rommel, well, he's good or better, blah, blah, blah. Then how he compares to Patton and all these other American generals, oh, he's, you know, he's okay or he's not as good or whatever. Then through Sicily, then through Italy, okay, he's becoming an, a bit of an idiot now. And then Normandy, okay, now I see why there's so much resentment, blah, blah, blah. So that's the reason why I'm doing that. At the same time, I then committed to Stalingrad because I'm an idiot. <laughs> so... Uh, Stalingrad, I put a, um, a poll up and said, can should I do Stalingrad or Crete or another one, Battle of the Bulge? And people went, nope, Stalingrad, please. That's why I'm doing Stalingrad. 
So I'm committed to that. And then I said on Patreon, if you donate $50 or more, I will do a Battlestorm for whatever one you want. And Mar uh, da uh, Darren Martin said, I I'll do it and I want Curland, uh, which is fine because that links in a little bit with um, Stalingrad. So I because it's like another, the, the trapped. So I can, I can link the two together. So that's why I'm doing Crusader. I'm going to do Crusader, get it out of the way with, done. Then I'm going to move on to probably Curland because um, it's not going to be quite as insane as Crusader is. <laughs> oh God, Crusader. And then once I've done Curland, it's Stalingrad, Stalingrad, Stalingrad. Get it done. Hooray! Um, then it's kind of like, right, work through the rest of the North African campaign, then get through Sicily and Italy and blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of the plan. Can I do a battle storm on Breslau? Absolutely. But I don't think it'll be yet, is my honest answer. Um, I'm surprised he didn't say about Ortana. Is it Ortana in Italy? That's one I want to cover at some point. Uh, a few people have asked me about that. Uh, and the Falklands War, surprisingly, I actually thought of doing that. Um, but then I've kind of realised that there's no point doing it yet because a lot of the records are still hushed, hushed. Uh, and I've heard rumours about things, which I'm not going to mention because I'll probably get targeted by the, um, I don't know, British Secret Service or something. So I'm not going to mention any of that. Um, but I suspect there are things going on behind the scenes that we're not hearing about. Uh, plus I can't read Spanish, so reading... Is it Spanish? Well, the Argentinians speak, so I can't dive into their sources either. So I'm really not the type of guy... I'm not the right guy for that, I don't think. And uh, Same with Iran and Afghanistan. What you ideally need for those conflicts is both sides of, this, of the same coin. That's why I'm learning German, so I can learn the German, <laughs> read the German sources, and then eventually learn the Russian. So I don't think... I might do a little video on them, but I don't think it'll be... It'll be a while away if I do, um, if I'm honest. Nico asked, will you ever talk about the engineering of machinery and weapons used in World War II or other conflicts? And would you ever talk about secret weapons of those conflicts? Well, yes, I will. Uh, the reason I haven't done so far is because uh, books like this are terrible. Yay! Uh, so <laughs> I want to do a series on tanks and stuff. And I want to talk about individual weapons like... Panzerfaust, Panzerschrecks. I've kind of already done one on Panzerfaust, but I want to do another one and really talk about how effective these weapons were and so on. And it's something I do want to absolutely do. The problem is, um, well, A, there isn't very good sources on these weapons. So I feel like, I mean, I've not fired a Panzerfaust, so how can I talk about them? I've not driven a Tiger tank, so how can I talk about it? Um, but also, I also have the view that the weapons of war are just tools and the main factor is the tactics and strategies used. That's why I did the video on the tank and anti-tank warfare thing and why the Germans had the early advantage, because it's more about how they use the weapons rather than the way, what the actual weapons are, I think. You know, personally, that's how I see it. So that's the reason why, is because I'm concentrating on that rather than the other things. Um, for example, T-26 is a, isn't a, a terrible tank, the, the, the worst part about it is the fact that it wasn't used properly. You know, in my opinion, uh, if they'd used it better, yeah, it wouldn't have won the war, but it would have done more damage than it actually did. So uh, for me, it's all about the tactics and stuff used rather than the actual weaponry itself. That's the reason why, but I will do it. The other part, the secret weapons. Ooh. Um, I don't subscribe to this idea of secret weapons. Because uh, what what's so secret about it? It's like, well, oh, the Germans were inventing a new submarine that could go an extra five... Like, it doesn't... I mean, it's just a better submarine, you know. Oh, the secret weapon of the V3, you know, V2. It's like, that's not... It's not really secret. Um, the only secret weapon, really, was the the nuclear bomb. Apart from that, I don't... I mean, what was secret? If the war had ended in 1943, let's say, you could go, oh, the secret weapon of the... Uh, Sturmgewehr 44. It's like, you know, where do you draw the line? It's like, if, 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 you know, they'd gone a bit further, 46, and the Germans had invented, I don't know, the flying tank. <laughs> Actually, that would have been a secret weapon. If they'd invented the, um, a laser cannon, an orb orbital laser cannon, uh, 
yeah, that might have been a secret weapon, but they weren't producing that sort of stuff. They were producing secret tanks, and it's like, it's not really secret. And if I go down that route, um, you know, I'll become the next Discovery Channel. The secret thing that Rommel said to his wife on uh, Christmas Day 1941 in a letter. I shared the champagne he gave me with my colleagues. Yeah, that's actually what he said. Uh, <laughs> so... Yeah, is uh, no, no. I don't. I don't forget. There's no secret weapons. There is no secret weapons of World War Two, except for maybe the bomb. But it's not like it was super secret because the Germans are trying to develop it as well. So uh, I don't know. I just I don't subscribe to the idea of secret weapons. Daniel asked, "What was the difference between the Axis and Soviet infantry divisions' ability to apply firepower at the beginning of the war? Did these ratios change significantly during the war?" This is also related to what Shab asked, sort of. I would like to know about the numbers and roles of the anti-air and anti-tanks in the divisional level in few stages of the war. I know that the Flak 88 was kind of a jack of all trades in some divisions serving as anti-air, anti-tank, artillery, and even bunker blasting. So. I would like to know about these aspects and numbers in the 37mm or 20mm anti-aircraft guns. He says, I heard about an interesting story of Russian anti-aircraft guns holding a panzer attack alone at Stalingrad, and how effective were these in the field? Not in the flat core, but those numbers are interesting as well. So these two questions are related because, in some ways, so basically there's two things you need to do. You need to watch the video I just linked to a minute ago about um, German why Germany was winning early in the war and anti-tank tactics. Uh, you need to look at that. You also need to watch some of the military history. Military history visualizes videos uh, talking about how many guns were in each of the divisions and how, as the war progressed, the German divisions seemed to have fewer manpower, but actually more guns per man, if that makes sense. Um, so they got better and better and better as, as things go on. At the early part of the war, there was a lot more manpower, a lot more riflemen. But as the war progressed, these guys traded their rifles for anti-tank weapons, more stugs, uh, you know, and more basically big guns and machine guns and stuff like that. So there was less squaddies, but there was more firepower. Um, so that that's probably why. But in terms of the anti-aircraft guns... Uh, what I will say, the, the one you're referring to at Stalingrad, <laughs> um, so I, I, from what I can remember off the top of my head, it's a woman's battalion of anti-aircraft guns, and it's at Rhinoch-ish, or the, at that sort of area, it might have been Spartanovka, I think it was Rhinoch. 16th Panzer Division reaches the Volga, and there's a, there's a I think it's a battalion, it might not have been, of women's anti-tank, anti-aircraft gunners, and they are firing at the tanks. As far as I'm aware from the story, they were unsupported, and they did their best, but basically they were overwhelmed, which is not surprising when you've got a panzer division attacking one battalion. Uh, it's not surprising, really. So that's the, the thing. It, they didn't really hold off the panzer attack at all. Uh, they didn't hold it off at all. They may have taken out a few tanks, but they didn't hold it off at all. They were absolutely overwhelmed. And uh, so, but that's not to excuse the fact that anti-aircraft guns weren't good. And what's interesting, we hear about the 88, you mentioned the 88 millimeter. You hear about this all the time. Well, what's interesting is that the British had a anti-aircraft gun, which was very, very similar caliber uh, in North Africa, in 1941 onwards, they had an anti-aircraft gun, which was very much the same, but they never used it as an anti-tank gun. And the Soviets also had them, uh, very again, very similar calibre. I think they did use them as anti-tank guns, but not to the extent that the Germans did, I don't think. Um, so it's not like the, the, the Allies didn't have the guns, they just didn't use them, which is really weird, especially when you consider how the tank guys are going, we need better guns, we need better guns. And it's like, we've got them, we're just not using them properly. It doesn't, it's a bit weird, really. So when I made this video, I didn't think I had the statistics for the Soviets, but it turns out that I do. <laughs> so it's a bit last minute now. So what I'm going to do is I will create a video next Monday, as always, but actually focus on the firepower of 
the Soviet divisions and see if I can then compare and contrast to the German divisions and actually make a proper decent video about it because it'll be interesting simply because I want to know how much firepower was there at, at certain stages of the war so that we can contrast this to the Germans and go, well, at Stalingrad or at Barbarossa or at Bagration or whatever, this is how much each of the sides had and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we'll see if we can come up with something cool with that. So I will answer this question fully, hopefully, next week. Patrick asked, do you think it would have helped the German war efforts if they would have shared their technology a bit more with their allies, giving some more production licenses for aircraft engines or tanks to Italy, for example? As far as I know, the Italians didn't have the industrial capacity to really do research and development to sufficient amount, but if they would have had the blueprints for something true and tested, i.e. a Panzer IV, would they have been able to produce those in any kind of numbers? Could the North African campaign for Italy be any different if they would have had the equipment? You're going to be surprised with this one. You're going to be absolutely surprised. So I did a little bit of digging and found out that actually they kind of tried. So this information comes from the book, uh, a new Vanguard book called Italian Medium Tanks by Capilano and Patis Pat is Stelly. I hope I've said them right. Um, so, early in the August of 1941, the Germans actually tried to get the Italians to build Panzer III's for them. They actually tried to license the production uh, with the Italians. Now, the condition was that the Italians could produce it, but they had to produce it without any armaments or gun sights. And I'm not sure why, um, but that's what they stipulated. Now, due to loads of different reasons, but the main one being that um, the Italians were trying to build a heavy tank, uh, which wasn't actually a heavy tank, but we'll get to that uh, in a minute. They were trying to build their own tanks, basically, or design their own tanks. So they, and they also didn't have enough materials and what's the point of building a tank without any armaments and gun sights there's no point doing it so the Italians said no to this idea and so it, the idea was dropped but then in the February of 1942 the Germans came back again and said hey would you like to do the same you know would you like to build another tank this time the Panzer IV and again you know the Italians and Germans discussed it and again it was dropped in the April of 1942 and then, in November of 1942, the Germans then did the same thing and said, hey, Italians, can you produce the Panther tank? And it, nothing came about that either, because, well, no. It, it, like, the Italians were like, we're not going to build a tank without armament and guns. What's the point? So, and, and I think Italian industry was actually quite limited anyway, so they didn't really... If they're going to build something, they're going to have to build the whole thing, not just bits which yeah so is it kind of weird so actually yeah the, the germans actually did or at least offered the blueprints for uh the, to the italians and the italians turned it down which is weird now the reason why is because the italians are building this heavy tank and when i say heavy tank that's how they called it they called it the heavy tank but it wasn't actually a heavy tank so the heavy tank in question is the p40 slash 26 i think it is and this thing was actually just a medium tank, but the Italians classed it as heavy because it was 26 tons, which to them was heavy. So it basically, it's a, it's a Panzer IV, but an Italian version, and it had riveted armor and stuff. Now, the idea for this tank went back to 1938, and the design of it began in the August of 1940, when Mussolini himself was like, no, no, we need a better tank than what we've got now. Because at the time, they were using um, M13-40 tanks. And these things are kind of, they're not good, really. They're very, they, they may be just about keeping up uh, in the early war with the British tanks, but not really. They can't take on the Matildas and stuff like that. Now, the first time these P-40 tanks were produced was in the summer of 1943, and only actually three actually reached the front before it had be surrendered in September. So it wasn't a very, it was way too late and, um, to be producing, you know, the equivalent of a Panzer IV. So, and, and the Italians also, because the Panther already 
was had been built and and tested and stuff, the Italians were like, well, what's the point of building more than five hundred of these P forties when it's already outclassed? So what what is actually happening is that the Italian uh, industry and and tank designs, what they're doing is they're going, well, we need to make a better tank because our tanks are poor. Okay, let's start designing it. And then you say like two years to design the thing. And then they go, uh, well, there's no point building it because it's already out of date. <laughs> so this is this is actually what's happening. And they do it several times. There's several designs where it's like, well, we'll only build 20 of these things now because it's already out of date. Well, let's design a new one. Oh, well, we'll only build 20 of these because it's out of date again. So the Italians aren't actually, they're too busy actually designing tanks than actually building it, it seems, which is really weird. And so that's why they're, they're sticking with the older designs in terms of actually producing them. Now, what is also interesting is that the Italians, unlike the Germans, the Italians actually go to war with 75 millimeter anti-tank guns. Oh, well, actually, they've got cannons, which are 75 millimeter and actually capable of taking out enemy tanks and stuff. But they don't actually put these things on the, at the front, which is, it's really weird. Um, you know, these 75 millimeter guns might be able to take out the Matildas. The Germans are producing, you know, 50 millimeter guns in 1940. And yet the Italians already have 75 millimeter guns and they don't put them on their tanks. The tanks like the M1340 tank is actually just using a 47 millimeter cannon, I think, off the top of my head. So the, the tanks are armed with poor guns. The Italians do have 75 millimeter guns, but they're not they're certainly not in North Africa. They're not giving them to the troops. So uh, why? I have no idea. But that's what's happening now. What they do end up doing is building a self-propelled gun with a 75 millimeter cannon on it, and this is the Semo Venti, I believe that's how you say it. And this was basically the Italian Stug. Now. The problem is they only build a very small number of, of these things. They are incredibly good, actually, because there are instances where just a handful of these things took out quite a few British tanks. So they are actually pretty good. And the design of these things began in 1940. So it's not like the Italians can't build something good. It just seems like there's some sort of weird thing going on with the production where they're not actually able to get these things out in the large enough numbers i don't know what the reason is for that um and i and you know i would really love to know but yeah there seems to be a bottleneck with the production so i think even if the italians maybe even had let's say a panzer 4 design or a panzer 3 design would they have actually built that many probably not and would it have changed the entire campaign in North Africa, I think it would have really helped. Would it have altered the war? I don't think so, because the main issue for North Africa was supply. And if they'd have had bigger and better tanks, that would have possibly meant more supply. But then they wouldn't have needed as many shells because they would have been taking out more tanks. But the thing is, what you have to remember as well, certainly in 1940-41, the Italian tanks can take out the cruiser tanks of the British. So the Italian tanks are still useful, and the Italian guns are still useful, and the Italian troops are still useful. They can still take out the British, um, and that doesn't really happen. So it's really a question of, well, why? Because they, they did have the equipment. They weren't, weren't as good. The, the tanks they had were lighter than what the British had because the Italians designed tanks to fight in um, mountains. Yeah, actually, this is this is actually related because you're thinking, why would they design tanks to fight in mountains? The whole point was Italy thought they were going to fight a mountain war again. So if you watch my video um, uh, for myths about the war, yeah, I think it's that, something like that. It actually talks about why the Italians design their divisions, but also related to this is the tanks. They fight. They want to fight a mountain war because they think they're going to fight in northern Italy. So they design their tanks to fight in mountains. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Mountain. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Would it have changed the war if they'd have had a design such terrible tanks? Uh, probably not. I don't think so. I think it's more... The problem with the Italians was 
much like the Germans, there wasn't enough oil and there wasn't a way of getting supplies to North Africa. That's more important, I think. Gimber asked, I have read that the Soviets didn't produce spare parts for the T-34 and would instead cannibalize for parts. Can you shed any further light on this? Obviously, this would only be practical with fewer different armoured fighting vehicles being produced in contrast to the Germans and in vast numbers. Yeah, I, I get this impression too, to be honest. And I've looked through the books. I've looked through Stumbling Colossus by Glance. I've looked through the Dubna book. I've looked through a few others. And I've read, obviously, a lot on Stalingrad. And I, I'm not seeing much in the way of mechanics. In fact... Um, when mentioning the Kotleban operation, I think it is, Glantz mentions that there wasn't really any repair facilities for the Soviets. And the Germans were well ahead of the Soviets in that sense because they were repairing tanks left, right and centre. But they had their problems as well. But they at least had the repair facilities going on. I know this is happening in North Africa as well. Uh, the British are behind... The Germans, but at least they seem to be ahead of the Soviets in this regard. But the Soviets just seem to not, just don't have the mechanics. And we can talk about why, probably, you know, it's to do with, you know, how many people had a car in the Soviet Union? Probably not many. So how many would have had a tank? Not many as well. So there's definitely a training aspect going on here. So maybe perhaps that is why they didn't bother repairing the tanks as much because what's the point? They may as well just produce another one. Yeah, the, the difference though, I think is this. So the German statistics also, I mean, you know, the Germans only produced so many tanks in the war and they go, oh, well, we got overwhelmed by numbers. Well, actually what happened was if you've got a tank that keeps going into combat, getting destroyed, but then repaired, you don't need to build as many tanks. So actually building as many tanks isn't necessary. And this is what you find is because the Germans don't record their tank so if your tank gets knocked out, they don't record that. What they record is how many tanks were left at the end of the day. So you might have Monday 100 tanks, Tuesday you go into battle and lose 50 of them. So you're like, oh, I've lost 50 tanks. However, by the end of the day on Tuesday, you've repaired 30 of them. So you've only actually lost 20 tanks. So they'll go, well, we only lost 20 tanks. It's like, no, you've actually lost 50 tanks, but you've you've repaired 30 and lost, you've only lost 20. So... The, the Germans are getting around that, and uh, that's where the Germans are trying to... Because rather than... I think they probably realise, well, we can't keep sending tanks all the way into the Soviet Union. We've not got enough a good enough logistical capability of doing that. So what we'll do is we'll give them lots of rep the spare parts and stuff so they can repair the tanks, which is what they do. So that makes sense. But the, the Soviets are the opposite. They're like, well, actually, we just need more and more tanks, not necessarily repairing them. Let's just keep sending tanks to the front. So there's there's different priorities there. And I think that's the reason why. But I'm only guessing because, I, again, the sources I have don't really mention it, which is unfortunate. Seraphim said, history is a debate, a wise man once said. <laughs> there is no bigger debate than that about leaders. Where do you stand on this topic? Keeping in mind that we all have our own points of view and our own likes and dislikes, which qualities do you think make a good leader? Who are the people from history that you think embody these qualities? History, history is absolutely a debate. I wish people would realise this. And there is no bigger debate than the leaders. <sighs> yeah, so this is part... The part of the reason... I said this in a while ago in one of my other videos, um, why I'm passionate about history. Part of the reason why is because I want to learn from history and apply that to myself. So what sort of traits, I guess you could say, what are the likes and dislikes and qualities that make a leader? So what I have discovered is that a trait no matter what it is always has a downside so you could say well this guy's really really good at attack he's like really fast let's look at rommel he's really fast and can really get if you want someone to get to a position it's rommel you pick rommel because he will get there nobody else will but he will he'll be like Pfft. and his force will be strung out over many miles but but that's the point like he will get to that position but it's costing massive amounts of organization to do it. So there's a good point and there's a bad point. If you've got an organized guy, he may be not as charismatic as needed. And there's always seems to be a trade-off. And it's surprising because, you know, there are traits you think, well, that's not a good trait. Like uncaring for your troops. You hear about, oh, well, this guy cared for his troops. Montgomery, for example, or um, several German generals do. There's that 
I forget his name, the general who, German general who walks around with a rifle. There's always like, oh, he cares for his troops, and Rommel's got that reputation as well. But then you think, well, actually, if you don't care for your troops, maybe you will use them better because you'll not be scared to put them in worse positions. And that's a trait that Zhukov has, for example. And you could say, well, that's not a good trait. But actually, when you look at Kotleban, when, you know, you, you've got to attack. There's going to be times where you're going to have to launch an offensive just to distract the enemy and prevent them from sending reinforcements elsewhere. If you want to attack, what you need is a guy who doesn't really care about his troops because he knows that they're going to suffer. So you need somebody who is uncaring. And so in that situation, that is actually a good trait for Zukov to have, which is why he's probably sent to the Kotleban area. Because if you want somebody to just hammer the enemy over and over again until your, your forehead's dead, <laughs> uh, that's what that's what Zukov does. So there's always a trade-off. Um and and that is something to bear in mind. If you if you choose, it's kind of like Crusader Kings. If you've ever played that game, like you choose a trait, there's always a sort of, well, two plus on intelligence, but one minus on intrigue. You know, there's always something that goes back against it, and I, and that's something to bear in mind. What is a good trait on the one hand is also a bad trait, and you know that is very much true. Now, in terms of who is who is the best. Um, leader of the war I don't know I don't really I don't subscribe to the idea that there is an amazing general and I'm gonna like O'Connor for example he's one of my favourites General O'Connor no one's ever heard of him again in Operation Compass um, but he he's a very good general and he exploits the and destroys the Italian 10th army Graziani is thrown into the dustpan of history but he also um, is very very um reclusive he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't like uh what's his name cunningham in east africa is very much like yeah and everyone's like oh cunningham's he's won this campaign and very much the press is all over him and ignore o'connor even though o'connor probably defeated the italians and, and caused the greatest victory of the war they're ignoring him and going after cunningham because cunningham's more social and whatever else and it's the same with montgomery montgomery you know, of all the things that he's bad at, one of the things he is good at is the press. He's he's interested in boosting his own ego and so on and so forth. So there's there's pros and cons again. And O'Connor, you've never heard of, but actually produced one of the best victories of the war, but you've not heard of him or the victory because he's very very quiet. So there there are, uh, as I say, there's traits and stuff like that. But I don't really want to kind of say well this is the best traits and stuff because i appreciate modesty and i like um i i like the idea of being bold and decisive kind of like rommel um and making a decision right i'm gonna go with this i like those sort of traits i also like organization planning uh that sort of traits um and i don't but i can see why sometimes it really depends on the situation sometimes not being them is actually good as well. So there's pros and cons, and I don't really know what to suggest here. To be honest, if you if you look into a general and you think, well, that's a good trait, always try and see what the bad trait is as well. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say this guy's the best. <laughs> Patton is the best. You know, I'm not gonna say that because I think it would uh, it would annoy too many people anyway. But also, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like I don't see it like that. Afflicted asked, question one, we commonly hear about how Patton is widely considered to be one of the best generals of the war, and that because of this German generals feared him. However, in a video released by Nicholas Moran, a wargaming employee who does a lot of great videos on tank warfare in World War II, revealed he couldn't really find any references to General Patton in German war diaries. He used this as evidence that the Germans probably barely even knew about him never mind feared him do you have any further insight or debate to add to this discussion good old pattern so this is going off the last question as well so pattern uh, i agree with chieftain i actually agree with chieftain the the thing is there's two points to this really so pattern is an army commander so that's pretty high ranking, but it's not the highest ranks. So I think it's, is it Bradley above? I think it's Bradley above Patton. So 
if you think about it this way, so Ike's Eisenhower is in charge of, you know, the Western Allies in a sense. So he's in charge of that. So they probably the Germans might have heard of Ike. They may have heard of Montgomery. They may have heard of Bradley if it was him in charge of Patton. Because these are the these are the fear marshals. These are the top brass. So they might have heard of them. Would they have really heard of the army and corps and divisional commanders? Because, you know, on the Montgomery, for example, you've got O'Connor. He fought in Compass and one of the greatest victories of the war. Would the Germans really have cared what the Italians got up to? Not really. The Africa Corps and later what happened in Tunisia, they might have heard of these generals then. Um, and the Africa Corps, certainly in North Africa, fighting against the enemy, they may have heard of it. But there's actually, it's surprising because even, even 8th Army during Crusader... Um, spoiler alert, uh, Cunningham, who was the the army commander in charge of 8th Army, he got replaced. The, the, it didn't affect morale because the guys were like, well, who's he anyway? <laughs> and he, he'd won in uh, East Africa. So it's, uh, you know, it, in some ways it's like, you, you know, the, the normal troops and the, maybe the divisional generals and stuff may not have heard of the guys above them, let alone... Uh, the enemy. So I, I I suspect that that's the case as well. Patton does have a reputation in the West and you know, that's fine. And he may have been the best American general. I, I don't know. Um, I, again, I'm reserving my judgment on these guys till later. But I do think that the second reason is probably more important. Um, not only that, but the, the second reason is basically eight or nine out of ten Germans died on the Eastern Front. That's where the majority of the fighting was. That's where the focus is. That's where, you know, the German army gets bled to death. So their focus is on the East, not the West. And that's also a reason why. So when Nicholas Moran says about German generals... Which general, German generals was he looking at? I mean, the, the, I'm sure the guys directly opposed to Patton will have heard of this of, of Patton, but would they have really known? Would anyone else have really known? I probably not. So yeah, I think that the fact is the Eastern Front is dwarfs anything that's happened in the West. So you're going to be hard pressed to find anyone who has heard of the Western generals because most of them were fighting in the East anyway. So. Yeah, that's probably the reason why. So I suspect it's, it is true. I can't really offer you any more insights than that. Um, but it, when I get to this, I will tell you. I will look into it, I promise you. It might be a while away, though. But Afflicted also asked question two. The traditional narrative is that the Germans lost the war because Hitler never listened to his generals. You and many others have made points that widely disprove this myth. The question is, if Hitler did generally listen to his generals, especially prior to the defeat at Stalingrad, why did he so consistently and firmly ignore the advice of his advisors and draft up obnoxiously large tanks that, at best, were a massive waste of resources and engineering man-hours? Okay, so this question is related... Well, it's split into two. It's really split into two. So, why did Hitler and his... Why did Hitler not listen to his generals is the first real one, or sort of listen to some but not others. Well, Hitler listened to some of his generals, and he favoured the opinions of certain generals, but not others. And you might be asking yourself, why? Which generals did he not like? He did not like the generals with Von before the name. Uh, von Manstein seems to be the, the sort of the exception to the rule, and I think it's just because he proved himself to be quite a decent general but apart from him Hitler does not like most of the von generals <laughs> the von generals so because the von means aristocrat I have land you know because von is from and it basically means I am from this place um, I don't think that's what the surname actually means but that's basically what it means if, if, I, if you've got a von then you are an aristocrat so Paulus for example doesn't have a von even though the, the Russians sorry the Soviets thought that he did and I actually asked him, if you watch um, Anton Jolly's video on that, they actually asked him, oh, are you Von Paulus? And he's like, no, I've got an apartment. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that's why Hitler doesn't like 
the aristocratic generals, the Prussian generals, and this is why he gets rid of them as the war progresses. He gets rid of Halder, uh, who, uh, if you read Centino, is like the last of the Prussians. You know, he gets rid of him, he gets rid of others, because he doesn't like these. And he, invite, he invites people in like Zeitler, Zeitzler, and others who don't have Von in their name because he prefers them. I'm not saying that Halder's a Von, but uh, you get the idea. So he really doesn't like aristocrats. Now, you might be asking yourself, why does he not like our aristocrats? Um, if, you know, if I was being honest, it's probably because he's a socialist. <gasps> oh, Tick's gone there again. So, yeah, we don't want the Bolshevik Brigade demo in this video, so um, I'll backtrack and go, I don't know. I don't know why he doesn't like aristocratic generals. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure there's a reason, but I don't know. Uh... <laughs> Oh no. Moving swiftly on to the second part of your question. So, uh, yeah, you said about the. Uh, so, why would Hitler want bigger tanks when they've got no oil? Because that's basically what you're asking. Like, so why didn't he listen to his generals and have smaller tanks and stuff like that? Well, actually, Guderian's saying we want bigger tanks. Uh, uh, not Guderian. Yeah, Heinz Guderian. He's saying we want bigger tanks, if you lately read his memo, if I remember correctly. So why were certain generals saying we want bigger tanks? I suspect that despite the fuel problems, bigger tanks on the defensive are actually better. So if you're on the defensive, you need a tank that can go, I don't know, 20 miles a maximum. It doesn't need to be fast. And if you think about it, most of the late war German tanks aren't fast. The Panther's the exception. Um, none of the heavy tanks are fast. Most of them barely move. So what you have there is basically a big gun that can move slightly. So if you're on the defensive, that's what you want. And these big tanks, yeah, they might consume a lot of fuel, um, but you're not moving them. You they're not going. They're not racing down a motorway uh, trying to get to the French coast. Unless, well, they did try, <laughs> but they didn't go very far. That's at the Battle of Bulge, but. That's the point. You, on the defensive, you don't need. You want big tanks, which have got big armor, which can just sit there and fire. So you, they're not consuming a lot of petrol, and I suspect that's the reason why. But when they do go into an offensive, like they do at the Battle of the Bulge, they come unstuck because these massive big tanks are consuming so much fuel, fuel they can't get anywhere. Um, and this is related to the railways as well, and the coal. We're going to say we're going back back around in circles. Uh, the coal is used in the trains, which then ship the tanks to the front, and then the tanks get off the trains and go to the front like a few miles. So that, again, they're not using that much fuel on the defensive. It's only when they come to actually attack, attack in the Battle of the Bulge, for example, when that strategy goes wrong. So. Actually, when, when if you imagine Germany's on the defensive and they're coming back and back and getting crushed from all sides, actually building bigger tanks makes sense. But yeah, they probably would have been better producing smaller tanks, if I'm honest. And the final question is, Walter, can you imagine future historians seeing both world wars as one conflict, maybe with the Versailles Treaty as a catalyst? I can, because I also see the... Uh, the world wars as the same conflict. So, hi. <laughs> uh, obviously, Versailles is the catalyst for World War Two, not World War One. But yeah, no, absolutely. I see them both as the same conflict. I see the period from nineteen hundred, maybe maybe nineteen o five, with the Russian Revolution going on there. Nineteen o five, uh, forget what you call it, and then to like nineteen forty eight or something as the same conflict. Maybe, maybe including the... No, would you include the Korean War? Probably not. I would probably say to the end of the war... So maybe 1946. That period, 1940, 1905 to 1945, is the same period. Um, I absolutely see that. Why? Because it isn't. It is the same. World War One basically begets 19, uh, you know, the Second World War. It, it's part and parcel of the same story. Um, it's like the Napoleonic Wars. There's several wars going on, but you put them all together so i'm going to put all these together and say that actually this is the same conflict absolutely so can i see in the future that they will do with that yeah yeah um will they still call them world war ones and twos i don't know because the napoleonic war i believe was also called the first world war or the great war so that changed its name so maybe they'll redo this and call it something else but i do think that this is the same conflict um but that is a historical debate which i want to hear about so if you guys don't agree with that 
let me know in the comments below. We can have a little dis bit of discussion and uh, leave it there. So yeah, don't forget if you would like uh, to ask questions, please donate five dollars or more on Patreon and you'll get a chance to ask questions in the future. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you to my patrons for supporting me. Obviously you guys made this video possible and the channel in general. So thank you very much and the rest of you, bye for now.